First of all, let me thank the organizers of this meeting, the RS meeting on quasars and galaxies on the edge of cosmic colonization, Elisa, Maxime, and David. And my name is David Sobral, and I'm going to be talking about some of the hosts, some of the most extreme hosts of early ionized bubbles and how we can resolve them already with Hubble, Muse, and Alma, and very soon with JWST. In simple terms, my talk is going to be how we can go from sort of globology, where we would only put a slit and get a single answer for a source, to actually resolving sources like CR7 by using ALMA to look at C2, Muse to look at Lamin Alpha, and Hubble to look at rest frame UV, and hopefully very soon using James Webb to look at the rest frame optical lines that will really allow us to gain even further information about these sources. Lamin alpha emitters are really spectacular, especially within the epoch of ionization, because if you find one, and it's specially luminous and a high equivalent width, it's almost certain that it resides on one of these early ionized bubbles. The reason for it is if we see lamin alpha, it means it actually escaped from resonance, and it means the bubble is large enough for the Lyman alpha photons to redshift out of resonance. But on top of that, actually, Lyman alpha profiles, once they get out of the interstellar medium, if they're actually shut or affected by the CGM or the IGM, actually by measuring those profiles, we can learn a lot about then the IGM, CGM, and even the interstellar medium. One way that we can look at this is if we compare the Lyman alpha profiles from sources at say around redshift 2.2, and we get really nice analogs to sources within the epoch of ionization, we can see how the line profile is getting out without being affected or significantly affected by the intergalactic medium, which by redshift 2.2 is essentially fully ionized. Now what we expect, and this is exemplified here, we expect that as we move into the epoch of ionization, provided that the conditions out of the ISM are very similar, and we can actually study that with analogs and understanding the interstellar medium conditions, we actually expect the blue peak to start being cut. And at some point, we will only be able to see the red part of Lyman alpha, even if the ISM within these Lyman alpha emitters is not cutting it off. In other words, if we actually find double peak Lyman alpha emitters within the epoch of ionization, and with the caveat of determining the systemic redshift very well, we can actually measure the size of ionized bubbles by looking at essentially the velocity shift from the red peak to the cutoff and the blue wing. And this is a spectacular example, which is called a one, that very likely resides in a relatively big ionized bubble and its properties seem to indicate that it might have done it alone. However, a really important question is, what is special about the host of ionized bubbles? Or in other words, what is special about luminous Lyman alpha emitters within the epoch of ionization? If they reside in an ionized bubble, it means something had to do it. And therefore, is it the production of Lyman continuum photons that is particularly high? Is it the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons? Or is it because these bright Lyman alpha emitters reside in overdensities. So this is one of the big questions that we should address going forward. In this talk, I'll be focusing on three very luminous Lyman alpha emitters. These are sources that were discovered with wide and deep emission line surveys, but that actually sample a wide range in UV luminosities. As you can see on the plot here, Masosa corresponding to a relatively fainter source in the UV, VR7 being the brightest in the UV, and CR7 being quite bright in both Lyman alpha and in the UV. And on the plot above, you can actually see how these sources compare with the more typical Lyman break population, with VR7, for example, being quite a good example of a typical, very luminous Lyman break galaxy. For my talk, I will be focusing on what we can learn essentially by exploring facilities or instruments such as MUSE on the VLT to tackle and cover Lyman alpha at high resolution exploring Hubble's exquisite rest frame UV resolution to actually decompose the sources or actually establish whether there are single compact sources. And also how Halma is crucial to try to detect dust continuum and also to look at singly ionized carbon or carbon two. And towards the future, this is really where things will be transformational 
because James Webb will actually open the rest frame optical window into these galaxies, allowing us to explore metallicities and even the ionization production of these sources to address the question whether they really are producing many more ionizing photons than actually we expect. Before looking at the resolved properties, we can actually look at the integrated properties. And if you look at the ratio between the infrared and the UV, all these sources remain undetected in the dust continuum. If you interpret this non-detection in terms of metallicity, it implies that they're incredibly metal poor. They're definitely dust poor. There's some room for very hot dust to be there, but very little. But ultimately, C2 provides a different picture, but also highlights the diversity of these luminous lamin alpha emitters. On one hand, Masosa remains undetected in carbon-2, so it's one of the sources where we have not detected any metal lines so far. CR7 is moderately luminous in C2, and VR7 is actually very luminous in C2. And this highlights the trend that was shown by Matei et al, that essentially the higher the combined star formation rate, then the higher your expected C2 emission. So if you want to detect a galaxy in C2 emission, it's very likely that you do so if you're looking at a galaxy that has a very high star formation rate. By looking at these galaxies with Hubble, we can actually see how they're decomposed in multiple components and actually measure their sizes. For CR7, Hubble really reveals that the source is split in these three different main components in the ultraviolet that sit on the Lyman alpha halo. But VR7, for example, shows almost, at least to first impression, a single very big blob, while Masosa seems to be much more compact. But there's also this component to the side that is actually relatively red. Overall, what we find is that these sources, once resolved in the UV, they show multiple components, and some of them show gradients within the UV rest frame colors. It's, of course, much more interesting to go beyond just the UV rest frame optical light, thick spectra, and specifically compare, for example, the spectra, the integrated spectra of Lyman alpha with C2, because this allows us to get a systemic redshift. We can also start to interpret the shifts to do with the size of the ionized bubble or with radiative transfer effects. But perhaps even more interesting is the fact that C2 is detected at such high signal to noise that we can start to look at the dynamics and how complex they might be, including, for example, finding evidence for perhaps outflows or shells within these galaxies. Of course, the picture is only complete when you do the same sort of observations by using MUSE so that you can also have a 3D view with Lyman alpha. What this allows you to do is to detect this beautiful extended Lyman alpha halos and to start comparing them with the UV and C2 from an integrated perspective, but also looking at different slices and seeing how C2 and Lyman alpha are varying when you go to different velocity offsets. Overall, what this is telling us is that for VR7, a luminous Lyman alpha emitter that is also a typical LBG, if you look at different slices, you can actually see that it resolves in two main UV components. There's also very strong gradients in both Lyman alpha and C2 that are surprisingly similar, although with some velocity offsets. Our best interpretation is that what we're seeing is a late stage merger where some dynamics exists, definitely not rotation. And this all exists on top of a smooth dark matter halo that is consistent with low redshift Lyman alpha emitters, but with potential kinematics that actually match C2 that need to be investigated Further. The presence of a Lyman alpha halo that is very similar to sources at low redshift also further indicates that we're in the presence of a galaxy that's sitting on an ionized bubble. And the Lyman alpha velocity offsets from systemic are always relatively low, again, consistent with an ionized bubble, but they actually change spatially. So we might be in the presence of not a perfectly spherical bubble, but more like an ionized region that is very inhomogeneous depending on the line of sight. One of the things that is already clear is that when you compare emission coming from C2 and the UV, and you look at their ratio, we see very strong gradients. And this is very strong evidence for strong metallicity gradients running across these galaxies, very likely resulting from the merger of different components, which might already have very different metallicities, and they're now mixing, and we're seeing it. And with James Webb and with the near-spec IFU, which is perfect for this field of view, we will definitely be able to establish what is the metallicity of the different regions and actually measure a proper 
metallicity gradient, if that is the case. Finally, by pointing news at CR7, we also detect this beautiful lamin alpha halo that extends over all the UV clumps that has a scaling that is very similar as well to lower redshift lamin alpha emitters, but CR7 is incredibly more luminous. Any source that resembles CR7 at lower redshift is a clear AGN, and CR7 so far there's little evidence for it hosting an AGN. What we can show is that the lamin alpha luminosity is definitely dominated by the UV brightest component. And then that component sits on top of an extended lamin alpha halo. There are multiple UV and C2 components on top of the brightest three. Deeper HST data also reveals an extra component, which is A2. Overall, this is evidence that CR7 is very rapidly evolving it's an earlier stage multiple merger, perhaps six, even seven components are coming together and where the galaxy will likely end up as being a BCG in the center of a very, very massive cluster. Now the past may be in black and white where we used to just look at blobs and at best place a slit and try to get a redshift for it. But the future is definitely brighter and much more resolved. Over the past few years, people already started discovering multiple lamin alpha halos around these sources, decomposing the UV into multiple clumps. Some sources may be just made of one single clump. Many of them have many of these clumps and many sources are probably at different stages of this multiple major merging. With better resolution and specifically with ALMA entering the picture and really revolutionizing the 3D study of C2, not just as a redshift machine, but actually to identify different clumps and to measure dynamics, it became possible to really spectroscopically confirm each of these clumps to reveal that some of them actually coincide with the UV, while others at different velocities actually are completely gone, even in the deepest Hubble image. And this is true for the case of CR7, for this component at minus 260 kilometers per second and a component that is around minus 450 kilometers per second. And with the addition of the fainter UV clump that actually sits around here, then currently CR7 is much more consistent with being a six-way merger, likely explaining why it was able to carve its own ionized bubble if that is the case. And of course, with JWST finally launching at the end of the year, and specifically with the near spec IFU being perfectly suited to tackle these sources, we'll finally be able to study these sources and to measure their metallicities, even resolved metallicities, to perhaps find even fainter sources, and to measure the flux from H alpha to measure lamin alpha escape fractions, and also the intrinsic production of ionizing photons in sources like CR7 and other hosts of early ionized bubbles. So the stay at home messages are provided here. And I tried to show you that luminous lamin alpha emitters at redshift 6.5 and above are really ideal to study because they're hosts of early ionized bubbles. And we're starting to make progress in terms of understanding what makes them special. By using high resolution data from Hubble to trace rest frame UV, Muse to trace lamin alpha, and ALMA to trace C2 and thus continuum, we can definitely reveal that many of these sources are decomposed in multiple clumps but they typically show smooth lamin alpha halos. They are typical of lower redshift lamin alpha emitters, but much brighter with higher equivalent widths and luminosities. These sources show a wide diversity of C2 and UV clumps, but all of them seem to be consistent with being very low metallicity and very low dust sources, where we are unveiling some complex and puzzling C2 lamin alpha dynamics. And finally, I think this is really just the beginning. These sources are indeed giving us a glimpse of what JWST may be able to unveil and crucially how important IFU observations will be in the coming years.